Uh, good evening and welcome to the latest in, uh, installation of Building the Scottish State. I have the great pleasure to have with me MP and candidate for Lothian, is that correct? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, Kenny McCaskill uh, for the Alba Party. Uh, uh, great pleasure to have you. So first of all, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like just to begin by you talking about your own personal story. You know, I mean, during your life, how you became interested in politics, the SNP, uh, independence, just in very, you know, in general terms. Well, I think these things come about from your from your family roots and whatever. And I grew up in a household where my parents would have been described as staunch Labour. My father had rejoiced at the 1945 Labour election victory. I remember being receiving a very kind letter when he died. He'd been a, an army officer in the war. He'd been the only army officer in the, his brigade that had been celebrating the victory over over uh, over Churchill. Uh, all the other officers were apparently uh, mortified. But, you know, he began to despair of, of labor. He worked, had to work abroad, as so many Scots had. My mother yeah. had been- But my, my, gra my, my grandparents included, my, yeah, my, great, my great grandparents and my grandparents included, you know, in the, of working abroad. Oh yes, God. well, that, 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 that was it. So that helped formulate it, opened my mind. Uh, so I'd come from a family background that was that journey in Scotland that ultimately Jimmy Reid uh, made, moving from the left into commitment to the Scottish Parliament as being necessary. So my dad had been a, a, a Labour man and my mum, they got persuaded to vote SNP. They were never political activists, but it was a political household in terms of, and I always remember Jimmy Reid talking about... Uh, Scottish socialism is based more on morality than on Marxism and Leninism. And I think that would be the same in my household. Mm -hmm. My mother was very much a church woman. It was the gospel, but it was a gospel of uh, the New Testament and uh, sharing inequality. My dad didn't go to church, but, you know, again, his socialism wasn't dogmatic, you know, uh, mm -hmm. communism. It was just uh, what was right and what was clearly wrong. I was never particularly active in politics. I took part in the 74 election as a, as a young 16 year old sticking out leaflets and chatting doors as many did in West Lothian. It was only in, uh, in the, 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 the late seventies when I was at university, I got more politically interested. I didn't join the SNP at that stage because like many, I had some doubts it wasn't left wing enough for me in terms of my political perception at the time. Alex Salmond in the 79 group persuaded me. So I joined the SNP in the, the early 1980s. So, so you, 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 know, you know Alex Salmon since the late 70s? I have. I was at school with Alex Salmon. Oh. We come from the same town. Although oh. I, I have to say, he was four years older than me, so he was closer to my big brother. But when you come from a small town of 5,000 people or so at that time, you knew everybody. So which, 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 uh, sorry, what, ta what town was that? Lonlodgo in West Lothian. Lonlodgo. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, you know, I've known Alex since the 60s, uh, you know, and... We were at school all about four years apart. Uh, so he signed me up and uh, basically I then got active in the SNP and remained there until my departure to the, uh, uh, to the, to the Alba party. But my commitment has always been to a Scotland that's social democratic. I've always historically in recent years described myself as social democratic in a North European tradition. My idols weren't so much in the Labour Party, but the, the Willy Brandts, the Olaf Palmas in Sweden. Mm -hmm. I, I was also... To digress, what also persuaded me, I remember, I said many students in the late 70s, I did the interrail. You took the interrail and you went off sleeping on trains, living in youth hostels. And I always remember in 77, uh, it would have been, I went off and I remember a friend and I ended up in Milan. Now I was ultimately to start work in Glasgow, but I remember landing in Milan. And I'd been told, well, in Scotland, we've got poverty, but you should see what it's like in Europe. And I got to Milan and I thought, wow, look at this place. Where is the poverty? Because it looked to be teeming with wealth in comparison to, you know, Glasgow that I visited. Mm. It didn't have the slums and deprivation. I'm not saying it didn't exist in Milan. I, I think Southern, like, it, it would have been more in Southern Italy. I mean, it maybe been, but certainly and Northern other, Italy. Yeah. Northern Italy was vibrant and put, you know, where I came from in the shade. And I always remember as well, I got into Amsterdam and there was a general strike of something going on. And they were striking in the Netherlands because there were 100,000 people out of work. And I remember thinking to myself, we've got 200,000 out of work in Scotland and we've got half the population. There is something wrong in my country. So the background of my family that brought me up with that background of you know, Scottish radicalism, which I've had the pleasure of researching and writing about in books lately, but also I think traveling around and thinking, 
we can do better than this because what's always driven me with Scotland, it's not how bad Scotland is because actually I've got a nice life in Scotland. Some folk don't, far too many live in poverty, but for many like me, Scotland, it's how much better our country should be. We have yeah. underperformed. It's like our national football team. We've had great teams and we haven't delivered. And I'm in the SNP to make sure we can build the Scotland that I know it can be, just like Stevie Clark wants to actually get us through to some final stages in our competition. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, and and when did you? And so you you said you you joined the SNP in the late 70s. early eighties. You know, to one because early. I stood for the party in the original elections in nineteen eighty two in uh, Whitburn Fault House, which was a bit of a baptism of fire. It was still a mining area. It was Polkemet Colliery. It was the days where uh, you know there were. There could be some hostility, if you could put it that way, in mining villages towards the, the, the SNP. But we got a remarkably good result. It wasn't a good result for the SNP overall. We only got one councillor back. I think that was Davy Ramsey and Bathgate East and Blackburn. Those were hard times for the SNP. I think some people in modern day SNP don't realise what it was like being in a party where you were delighted if you got into double figures in the opinion polls. I stood for the election in 1983 as a candidate for Westminster in Livingston. Where we managed to hold our deposit, it was I think twelve percent, uh, and that was viewed as a that was viewed as a success to get thirteen or fourteen percent simply holding your deposit. So you joined the SNP, you took part in elections to fly the flag. Yeah, and how would you characterize the evolution of the ideology of of the SNP over time? I mean, uh, I, I mean, it's always been about independence, but. Uh, I mean, you and I mean, there, there's the perception that it's sort of center left, cent, uh, you know, social democratic, but uh, but maybe it seems less so now. How how would you characterize over the uh, over the years, uh, maybe in reference to the Labour Party, for example? I mean, I think you're right. I think it's less so now. I think it's very much driven towards the center. I mean, the SNP that I joined after '79 had been riven by uh, by the trauma of being frankly badly let down by the Labour government. I think in hindsight, you know, bringing, being seen to bring down, uh, you know, Calacan's government wasn't wise, but, uh, you know, that scarred the SNP and it took time to, to build back trust. I think I joined at a time of Alex Salmon, Jim Sillers, Margot MacDonald, the 79 group. The intention was to make sure that it couldn't be independence, nothing less. The SNP had to have a position on other issues if we were going to persuade people of the merits of independence. And that's why we had to have a centre-left position. I might be slightly more to the left, but I think the SNP certainly what became under Alex Salmond was a left of centre party, a moderate left of centre party, but there was a socialist faction. There were some who perhaps we describe as light right wing, but very few. And we coalesced around that European social democratic view. It's never been a party that was syndicalist tied to the unions as Labour mm -hmm. was, and it's something ways I think that's a good thing, which is why I've always viewed the analogy as being much more akin to the some of the European social democratic parties where they were separate to the trade union movement as opposed to the Labour Party that's basically a vehicle for the trade mm -hmm. union movement or was until more recent years. So I think the transition into a party was necessary. In the 80s, we had to go through events such as the factory uh, occupations that I was involved in at Plessy and other places. The SNP won its spurs. Most importantly of all, I think, was the uh, poll tax campaign and I think the importance of the poll tax campaign was it gave the, late, the Scottish National Party a history. And I remember thinking that at the time because I used to chat doors in the late 80s into the 90s and you could always remember that folk would say, they would agree with you when they said, well, Labour's no very good and they're not the party they were, but they had a history. that They'd been the party in 1945 that brought in the welfare state, the NHS. We didn't have a history. And all of a sudden we fought the poll tax. We were the party that stood by people who couldn't pay when they needed it when Labour were saying pay. So I always thought the benefit of the poll tax campaign would be long term, and it was. We got some of it in 92 because housing schemes that had previously not been a fertile territory for the SNP suddenly became quite uh, you know, solid places for the SNP. That was the basis for the modern SNP going on. So we won our spurs. The minor strike had been the same to some extent, not as big as the, the poll tax campaign. And the 90s was basically Alex Salmon forging that party that became a threat, we only got devolution because Labour worried that sooner or later, if they didn't deliver with their victory in 97, when people you know, kicked the Tories out of Scotland, if they didn't deliver, they worried that there would be a 
upsurge and they would be kicked out perhaps akin to what happened in 2015. So they delivered a Scottish Parliament and the rest has been built from there. Yeah. And uh, what, what, what was based on the decision to leave the SNP and to become a, a candidate for the ALBA party? Well, I mean, I, I'd stepped out from politics in 2016. Uh, I'd always been going to leave after the referendum. As soon as I knew the referendum, it seemed a symmetry to me. I'd been a, I'd been a lawyer from 1980 to 1999. It was almost 20 years. I'd been a politician from 99 until uh, 2016. So I kind of viewed that irrespective of if we won or lost, it was time to pursue a new career. So I stepped down in 2016. I wanted to travel before I got too old. So my wife and I took one of these round the world tickets and off we went uh, for <laughs> many weeks. I wish I'd gone for more. I came close to getting some big jobs, I would have to say, uh, without going into them. None I would have to say in Scotland, where I seem to be persona non grata, but, uh, but you know, I did get down to the final cup for jobs in Geneva and in Dublin, which, uh, and indeed in Brussels, which uh, just, I think, shows some of the small mindedness in Scotland. But I used my time wisely. I, I'd always wanted to write a biography of Jimmy Reid, which I did, and I've written some other books on Scottish historical events. I wasn't going to return to politics. I'd been writing as a columnist, just, you know, bumping my gums as columnists do. And then I got um, asked by people in 2019, would I come back in? I had to think long and hard because I actually was enjoying life, walking the dog and writing. I had to put aside. But a mixture of partly being shamed because of an old friend who's been an XMP activist for years who chapped every door in Musselburgh in... Uh, the referendum in 2014 and was chatting them again he was encouraging me so I felt a bit ashamed I felt encouraged so I came back in and uh, uh, was you know delighted to return it wasn't to come back in to be a Westminster MP it was to come back in and deliver that final push for independence because I think we are almost there but it won't come by accident it has to come by design I've been disappointed in some ways. I'm not going to go into great detail. There's things I disagree with in SNP in terms of democracy, in terms of preparations for independence, in terms of issues on hate crime bill and gender identification. But I just decided it wasn't for me. The Alba party only approached me in the beginning or middle of March. So it was relatively new to me, but it didn't take me long to make up my mind that I think this is the... This is our chance. This is our opportunity. I had been writing columns and papers, working with Chris McElhenney and the likes of uh, Angus Brendan Neal, arguing that the section, the section that the SNP has got into is a dead end. Yeah. I just don't believe that Boris Johnson is going to blink. He didn't blink on Brexit. He'll not blink on us. And therefore, this idea that we return even more SNP, MP, MSPs, and suddenly out, he says, okay, there you go, I've changed my mind. That's not going to happen. That's why I think turning the election into a plebiscite, maximizing the independence vote. And I do so on, for two reasons. One, I think, you know, this is our best opportunity. The British state has never been weaker. It's our obligation to strike. We're facing a government that's incompetent, a prime minister that's unpopular equally. Our economy is being damaged. I noticed it in East Lothian with the consequences of, you know, custom tariffs and affecting the food and drink industry that's been built there. Our social services, our NHS are threatened by uh, trade deals that are coming down the line, especially with the USA. The powers of our parliament are threatened by an internal market bill and even our destruction of a planet is threatened by an arms race that Westminster has, uh, has reinstigated. So we've got to well, go yeah, tell me a little bit about that. I, I heard about that, but what, what is the, the the thing? Are they going to renew the nuclear weapons? Or what, what they're, is increasing the, the number of, they're increasing the number of warheads by 40%. You know, how many times over do you want to destroy the planet? Uh, meanwhile, all the military are pointing out that actually the biggest threat we face is terrorism, you know, a dirty bomb or whatever, and we'd be better at tackling inequality given that so much terror terrorism is homegrown and even that that's external would be better used in intelligence rather than in uh, rather than a nuclear weapon because where are you going to launch it okay and what is the mechanism by, by which this becomes a plebiscitory election i mean i saw alex in the in alex's declaration that you know he's got a rather than an 11 point plan he's got a one point plan that is to begin negotiations on day one 
uh, with the British state. Um, and uh, is, is that, does that resume it pretty, uh, does that summarize it pretty well? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't think we, we can go into details. I mean, I think what we're basically saying is we've changed the dynamic of this election. This election was going to be sleepy hollow. Folk were going to fall asleep watching it because the whole debate was going, was, there, was Nicola Sturgeon going to get a majority? Who was going to come second? Was it Labour or Tory? And that was basically it. I would have thought the turnout was going to go down. As it is, we've made independence the issue in this election. We've even got Douglas Ross saying that Tories should vote Labour in some constituencies to block the <laughs> independence parties. We've got Alliance for Unity trying to max the unionist vote. So all of a sudden, Alba has created, you know, the election on the constitution, which is what is necessary. It's necessary to turn out the SNP vote. It's also necessary to maximise the independence vote. So we are doing that. Uh, equally, exactly the same as we've changed the dynamic of the debate, we'll change the dynamic of the outcome. Because if the outcome was to be a SNP Green Coalition, I don't think independence would be front and centre. I think if Alba is back there as part of an independence supermajority, then I think all of a sudden, as Alex Salmond's correctly said, it's not Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister of Scotland, saying, please, Prime Minister, can we have a Section 30 order? It's the Scottish Parliament that has been democratically elected by the Scottish people, delivering an independent supermajority, saying, we, the elected people of Scotland, the representatives of the people of Scotland, we want to start the negotiations and discussions on independence. That could be a referendum. It could be further court action. It could be international. It could be simply making sure once we can socially distance and get out, that we start marching again to show that the people of Scotland are not prepared to take this lying down. So we'll <clears throat> work out that plan. Mm. But uh, what will be clear is exactly the same as the debate has been changed, the outcome and the action by the parliament will be changed and strengthened. Okay, and what kind of, I mean, of course it's impossible to predict, we don't know, but I mean, do you have a kind of a time scale envisaged? Uh, simply, I'm asking that because uh, as I mentioned before, I've been in touch with uh, representatives from EFTA and they um, basically, uh, the, the, the main requirements for EFTA membership is that uh, Scotland the, that the, that the Scottish Parliament be sovereign? That it that it's capable of you know uh, 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 of signing international treaties and the powers to abide by them. Uh, once that's accomplished, uh, all that would be necessary would be for the Scottish government or Parliament to send a letter to the EFTA Council requesting um, uh, you know membership. They would undoubtedly accept, and then they would uh, and then the three. Uh, EEA members uh, of the four, which exclude Sweden, uh, sorry, ex exclude Switzerland, uh, but Liechtenstein, Norway, and um, and Iceland would unit would speak at one vo with one voice at the uh, at the EEA council to get Scotland back into the EEA. That could be done very quickly. He, th this person assured me, uh, but Scotland has to uh, become sovereign. You know, the, 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 the Scottish Parliament has to be sovereign so that they can so that they can sign treaties and, and and the powers to abide by them. Any idea on what kind of time frame that could be accomplished? Because that, I mean, it, it's so important. I mean, the, the fishing industry, the agriculture industry, all that stuff. I mean, you know, it couldn't. It that can't happen soon enough. Uh, well, you know, it can't. Time is of the essence because. You know, the Brexit transition is uh, proving problematic. The threat coming down the line is huge, but it's not just in terms of what's going to happen to our NHS with uh, trade deals. It's the austerity that's going to be imposed. This the poverty and unemployment that's coming through post-coronavirus uh, restrictions eased. Many households are going to be finding that there isn't a job to go to. So we've got to strike for independence now. If we don't, then it will be a much harder uh, situation that we'll face. But equally, we've got to do it if we're going to be able to control the levers of power. Because if we're going to tackle you know, the, the, the legacy of coronavirus, which is going to be significant for years to come for every country, we've got to control our economy. We've got to be able to address that, to protect our fishing, to protect our food and agriculture, to protect our manufacturing, and indeed to protect our people from austerity. Because I was delighted to see the IMF talking about wealth taxes. I have to say, I think the Thames will freeze over before Sunak and Johnson bring in wealth taxes that will tax the rich. Yet yeah, that's what should be getting tackled. Uh, that's why we need to strike for independence. But your concept of thereafter, once you're a sovereign nation, I'm told that EFTA membership can be within months. And no, it, I, my, 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 that's my information as well. I mean, more like weeks, you know, but... Yeah. It, 
Yeah. But Very... it's getting independence. You know, we can't give a timeline about what happens after the count is carried out on the 7th or the 8th of May. What we can say is that dynamic has changed. If you have a parliament that represents independence that has the backing of an electoral mandate, then that's vastly different, different from a, minute, prime minute, a first minister of a political party. It's the people of Scotland. Now, remember Canon Kenyon Wright when it was Margaret Thatcher, you know, about, you know, the lady says no, well, he's a, we're the people of Scotland and we say yes. And that what that's why we have to make this the independent supermajority so that it's the Parliament of Scotland says, Scotland's voted, we've decided, we want negotiations. Does that mean a referendum? Maybe, at some stage it will have to be a referendum, but it also could mean negotiations with the Westminster government about where we go and what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, one, and, and I, I, I became involved in, in this, uh, I'm, I mean, I live in France, I'm obviously, an, an, you know, American of origin, but with Scottish uh, roots, <clears throat> and then, and I, I teach, uh, I've taught political science here in France for, you know, uh, many years at, at, the, at the University of Rennes, and um, I've been focusing on American civilization up until about 2010, but then I remember, you know, hearing that Alex Salmon had won the 2011 election on a basis of a referendum, and then my life changed, and I was like, and the, the first thing I thought was, the Scots need a, a good written constitution. And so I became involved in that. I wrote for Newsnet for a couple of years about constitutional issues. I met, you know, I came many times to Scotland and I've been to back and forth to Scotland for many, many times over the past uh, years up until 2019. But, uh, but, but what, I, what I found was that, uh, I, I mean, I had, I, I've, I've developed a written constitution. I, 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 we presented it to Mike Russell in the parliament uh, and, and many others, but there just doesn't seem to be an interest in it. I, 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 and, I, I, and for the life of me, I can't really understand it. And, um, and, and my view is that I think that it, along with your campaign, you know, uh, you know for, for ALBA, I think that a written constitution should be a central part of it. I mean, that, that's, that's my view, but, uh, and I'd be more than happy to, you know, share other th things that I've developed on that subject. But, um, uh, but, um, uh, but there, again, it, it seems, and I have other colleagues, John Drummond, Elliot Bulmer, and others who have also presented their work to the Scottish Parliament on the Constitution, but there just seems to be a total lack of interest on the part of the government. And may maybe you could give me some insight as to why that is, because it, 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 it would be... Uh, I mean, I think there's two things. First of all, dealing with the constitution, I agree. I think a written constitution is essential. I think every country should have a written constitution. Those countries, and particularly the UK, is all the worse for not having it. It's part of this you know, myth about the sovereignty of parliament that allows for all these things. We've got habeas corpus. Actually, you know, to be fair, if it hadn't been for the Supreme Court in the UK, uh, then I think the position of citizens north and south of the border would have been a lot worse. There should be a written constitution. I remember when I was Justice Secretary in Scotland having discussions, I've forgotten his Christian name. He was a, he was a Tory and resigned over Brexit. Grieve, he'd been, was it Grieve? He'd been, he'd been. Dom Domin Dominic Grieve. Dominic Dominic Grieve. Grieve. He'd been their Attorney General. He's a very pleasant man, a very no, no, I, I, man. I've admired he, him, you know. Yeah, yeah he supported a, a written constitution for the UK. I mean, the argument I took is, well, I think there should be a written constitution for the UK, but I think there should be a written constitution for Scotland. So every country should have one because I think citizens are entitled to know what their rights are. They should be enshrined and they should be able to litigate to seek to protect them. Why there's been so little interest in the SNP, I, I, I don't know. That seems to me to be very disappointing. As I say, when I was having discussions with Dominic Grieve, we were looking at, you know, almost shadowing what they were doing and arguing as a government that if you're bringing in a written constitution, we want one for... Scotland uh, as well. I, mean, I have to say it's part of one of the reasons I've left uh, the SNP. I've been uh, rather despondent because it's not just failure in a written constitution, it's failure in addressing borders, currency, pensions and every other issue that we know is going to be critical to uh, persuading the people of Scotland. We have not been maximising the independence vote and doing the spade work that was necessary. We came close in 2014. We don't need to, you know, work as hard to get from 25 to get from 45 to over 50 percent as we did to get from 25 to 45 mm -hmm. but uh, we haven't been doing the work that was done in the run-up to 2014 and that's that's frankly shameful
Yeah, uh, and, and in, in my view, I, I mean, I remember the first uh, column I wrote for Newsnet in 2012, in August of 2012, and I, I wrote for the next two years until 2014. But I, I was arguing that that, 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 they, that there should be a written constitution put out now, at least a draft, because there's so many questions that revolve around it. You know, what kind of government they're going to be? What are they going to be that your individual rights? What are you going to be, you know, uh, what, uh, you know how is it going to function? And and I, I know that my colleague, uh, John Drummond and, and Elliot Ballmer went to see, I believe they went to see Alex Salmond and they talked to Alex Bell and Alex Salmond, I think. And Alex Salmond apparently said, you know, they, they, they you know, made a, a spiel for uh, at least an interim constitution. And Salmond was like, okay, Alex Bell, you take care of it. I, I, I'm summarizing. I wasn't there, obviously. But it, it, but it wasn't taken up after that. And so there was the thing like, look, we're offering you this you know the, the the possibility of having this, mm -hmm. and 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 it wasn't taken. And I think it could have, in my view, it could have made a big difference. And uh, uh, our group, the group that I'm working with, um, we've taken the uh, interim constitution that was proposed in 2014, and we're reworking it, and uh, you know, to 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 adapt it to the more modern circumstances. And and uh, you know, I'll be happy to share it with you once we get into a you know a, a you know a presentable form. But I think that if that. I think that being front and center in your camp in the in the Alba campaign would be very useful uh, in showing what you know what Scotland could be and and what, and, and especially things like uh, you know regarding the uh, judiciary and the separation of powers that has seen has has proved so inadequate uh, to the uh, you know at, at this present at this present time, given, uh, given the Alex Salmon situation. So uh, how do you, what do you feel about I think, that? No, I, I, I would actually, I, I think you're right. I mean, because I think actually supporting a written constitution also juxtaposes ourselves with the position south of the border, because you almost get the whiff of the age of repression is beginning to dawn south of the border. Uh, the police bill, some of the, uh, some of the work that is going on in Westminster is decidedly uh, insidious. Uh, yeah. And therefore, you know, I think you do have to have a written constitution to protect yourself. It's part of the position at the moment where we should be majoring on independence, because it seems to me that risk has transferred. There's an openness and willingness of seeing in the opinion polls. You know, I'm always minded of uh, a story I tell. I remember reading the biography of, of uh, uh, the, the, the teeth of John Costello, who was a mm -hmm. T-Circuit Ireland who declared the Irish Republic in whatever it was, 1947. You read his biography. In, it was 30, in, uh, 37, right? Wait. 47. 47, 47. Okay. he declared 47. the Irish Republic. Okay. Uh, he right. removed the Irish Free State into the Republic of Ireland. But uh, he had been a young barrister in 1916, and he tells a story about how he'd been golfing and was very outraged when he couldn't get home because of, you know, troops and barricades that were up in the street. He opposed the Easter Rising, but see, uh, because he was part of a, a fairly wealthy Irish elite that believed that, you know, an Irish parliament would come, he would be a wealthy barrister, Ireland would remain within the British Empire and everything would be hunky-dory. <laughs> and didn't and objected to, uh, to that. By 1922, when it came to the referendum for the Irish Free State, he, along with almost everybody else in Ireland, saw no alternative but to leave. You know, Ireland had to become an independent nation. In some ways, that's reflected in Scotland. After Brexit, you know, in the run-up to 2014, we were told, if you vote yes, you risk your EU membership. If you vote yes, you risk the strength of the pound sterling. If you vote yes, you risk Scotland being a small backwater with great British prestige and the good it does in the world. And what we've seen is we're out of the EU, the economy's in tatters and still struggling, and British prestige is, you know, bombed, you know, creating needless enemies with big countries and with wee countries as they blunder around the world. So risk is transferred. The risk now is staying in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a risk in becoming an independent country, but there's a bigger risk in staying within the UK. The same position that, you know, John Costello and others... Mm -hmm. Actually, there was risks in going to the Irish Free State. But they couldn't stay within Britain and the Empire after what had happened with the with the civil war and all the disruption that had been ongoing. So I think you know things in Scotland have moved. Why are these things? I don't know. I mean, I think to be fair to Alex Salmon, I think a lot of that was encapsulated in the white paper. 
there has to be an interim constitution because ultimately the written constitution has to be decided upon the parliament of a sovereign Scotland. So you have to have an interim constitution, but I think you're right to increase it as, a, <clears throat> as an issue. But it comes back to where is the work on currency? Where is the work on borders? Where is the work on pensions? All we have seen in recent years from SNP leadership has been a growth commission that has been made redundant by coronavirus and was indeed arguably redundant when it was first printed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, let's see. And uh, uh, and and it, given your experience as justice minister, uh, and I'd, I'd I'd really like to get your views on this and, and, and to inform what we're trying to do with uh, you know redeveloping this interim constitution. Uh, what are the based on the salmon? imbroglio that you're very, very familiar with. What are some of the things that need to be done in the, in the Scottish judiciary very quickly to, uh, to well, I don't know if reestablish is the right word, but establish, at least establish, uh, uh, separation of powers, the, uh, the potential abuse of um, you know, of, 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 you know, of, uh, of the Scottish government into prosecuting political rivals, this type of thing. And before you answer, just to say, just to say, I see the questions coming in and we will address them at the end. But uh, just as, based on your experience as a justice minister, oh. what, what, what would you change about the Scottish judi judiciary at this point? Well, I don't think we need to change the judiciary at the present moment. I think it's a Lord Advocate in terms of the role. It's a historical anachronism that the Lord Advocate in Scotland has two roles. He is both, or she, because it has been Dame Eilish Angelini, the Lord Advocate is both the chief prosecutor in countries that would be the director of public prosecution down in England, and they are also the senior legal advisor to the Scottish government in England, for example, that would be the Attorney General. Those two issues have to be separated. Uh, that will actually require either independence or indeed a change with, with from Westminster because the Lord Advocate is enshrined within the Scotland Act. But I think, you know, you can keep the name. I actually would keep the name Lord Advocate for the Chief Prosecutor, but I think the Chief Legal Advisor for the Scottish Government should not be the Chief Prosecutor in the land. He or she should be somebody entirely separate and should advise the government as an Attorney General would. So you have to separate those two roles because there's something gone far wrong in the, the body, the prosecution team that the Lord Advocate uh, oversees. I have served with previous Lord Advocates. I know many people who serve as procurator fiscals or have or still do. I hold them in huge regard, but I think something's gone far wrong. It's gone far wrong in the prosecution of Alex Salmond. It's gone far wrong in the role of the Lord Advocate in terms of advice given to the Scottish Government at the same time as the prosecution of Alex Salmond. And it has gone far wrong in the admission by the Lord Advocate, the current one, that they perpetrated a malicious prosecution relating to Rangers FC. That is extraordinary. It has not happened in living memory. Probably not happened, you know, until you go back into the dark days of when uh, it was abused by the Dundases and others. So something's gone far wrong around a cottony relating to this Lord Advocate. We need to separate those posts and separate those powers. The head of the prosecution service cannot be advising the government. They must be entirely separate. Okay. And what and what specifically, uh, given your very, very direct experience with the, the uh, with the Salmond affair, including uh, you having uh, released uh, some of the some of a very small tr uh, tranche of the text messages to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, publicly. Uh, and uh, just tell me about that, and what it, you know, what you learned from it, and what you what your experience with that is, what your experience is with that. I mean, I think first of all, I mean, I was a defence agent for twenty years, and I've been involved in some major trials. I've been involved in murder trials. I've been involved in rape trials. I've been involved in very serious criminal offences. I have to say, I looked to the charges facing Alex Salmond, and I think, in my experience, they wouldn't have been proceeded with. You know, the information that the police and the Crown have would have uh, seen, if anybody else, it would have been what they called no prod, not proceeded with. A red line would have been driven and scored through it. Over 400 witnesses were in interviewed. Over 700 precognitions were taking place. And I have to say, that is extraordinary. That's the sort of resource that I saw go into serial killers, you know, major murder investigations, not into something where charges were brought 
that frankly wouldn't have been brought in the district court in Scotland. They were so risable. So something went far wrong there. And as I say, that comes back to the requirement to separate the powers. That has been compounded by positions both related since, where it has come to light in the civil case that the permanent secretary of Scotland did not appear to be obtemping a court warrant. Now, having been both justice secretary and indeed, uh, and indeed, you know, a defence agent for twenty years, if a court warrant comes into Independence Live or it comes into Kenny McCaskill or it goes to the Scottish government, you don't say, "Well, I'll maybe give you this or I'll maybe give you that." That, that, that was bewildering to me too. Yeah. Pockets. yeah, and to have a permanent secretary who appears to have decided not to release information and where a search almost had to be conducted by the Crown. You know, it's just extraordinary how that woman remains in a job is, is, is incredible. So I, it, it clearly was. Yeah. That's why I don't think the problems with the Scottish judiciary. The Scottish judiciary, in terms of Lord Preckland, you know, supported the application by Alex Salmon, found that the case was, you know, tainted with bias, was unlawful, uh, and, you know, <laughs> upheld it. And the, you know, the tragedy was that we then had a permanent secretary that said they'd lost the battle, but not the war. And we then had a criminal case brought. And I think what will have to come out in due course was what was the Lord Advocate doing in terms of a criminal prosecution, either himself or by others acting on his behalf, at the same time as legal advisors, including himself, were taking action on civil matters that they knew were going down the plug hole in the court case. So, you know, I think the whole thing stinks and requires to be a judge-led inquiry. It's just not right. And and I mean, you know, having you know studied American criminal uh, criminal procedure and and having taught that for many years, I'm just bewildered by the idea that that, 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 that the evidence could be subpoenaed and then you know little bits here, little bits there, and you know that, that, that there's not full disclosure of evidence during the discovery process. How how can it even be? I mean, I, 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 I'm less familiar with the, uh, you know, legal safeguards in Scotland that would compel disclosure of testimony. But maybe you could speak of, I mean, how oh. how could they even do that? I mean, you know, I mean, in America, they'd be th thrown in the slammer, or, you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, or, or or at the very least, the, you know, the, any any appeal would be immediately accepted and uh, and overturned because because the ev certain evidence was disclosed. But how how could that happen? And 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 is the and and are the legal safeguards strong enough to ensure that level of you know conformity with what should be basic criminal procedure? I mean, I actually think the the law is fundamentally right. It's down to the individuals. And yeah. the change that is yeah. necessary is separating that role. You're quite right. This is extraordinary. In 40 years involvement with law in Scotland, 20 years as a practitioner, almost eight as Justice Secretary, and I'd been the shadow uh, spokesperson before that. I've never heard of this. If the court said jump, you said how high? When you were a court officer and a senior civil servant is a court officer, as a young lawyer would have been, if the court say produce the documents, you produce the documents. You know, and I got that in divorce actions, I got it in civil actions, I had it in criminal actions. I have never heard of this. And why the Lord Advocate hasn't uh, taken steps uh, to deal with the permanent secretary, I don't know. But as I say, it comes down to the whole system is, we need that separation of powers. So the Lord Advocate's role requires to be changed. And also individuals have to consider their positions because I had a good relationship as a Justice Secretary with the Permanent Secretary, but Sir Peter Housen and indeed his predecessor, they were never bosom friends. If they thought I was out of order, they said, you cannot do that. I worked closely with Chief Constables. I worked closely with the Lord Advocate. I had a good relationship with them, I have to say. Some people used to criticize that. I used to think, well, that just seems to be daft. Surely you want a situation where the, where the Justice Secretary and the Lord Advocate and Chief Constable at least have a good relationship as opposed to where they're dysfunctional equally. I would never dream of asking them to condone actions by me that were supportive of, you know, criminality or illegality or were untoward. And equally, I can assure you that neither Ailey Shangelini nor indeed, you know, Frank Mulholland, nor would Steve House or any chief constable that served in the previous, you know, uh, regional constabularies, none of them would have embarked upon this without saying, you're out of order there, I'm not doing it. Why, why do you think it 
is being conducted this way at this point. And, and, and when we were speaking before the, um, the, the, the show, I was mentioning Craig Murray and that he is, it, Craig Murray has been visited. Well, you know, the, 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 he's being asked whether he was the one that disclosed that those text messages to you. And, and you, you know, I, t- I talk about that a little bit and the, and the role that the police are being asked to be in that they don't want to be in. I mean, the police in Scotland, you know, do investigate crime, but ultimately the police in Scotland are under the direction of the Crown Office. It's the Lord Advocate that directs, because at the end of the day, the police investigate and they make a report to the Crown Office, who then bring charges. Uh, The position at the present moment is Police Scotland are carrying out investigations, not relating to anything ongoing with regard to Alex Salmon, but to what has happened since. Craig Murray's been interviewed, I've been interviewed. All of this has come about not because Police Scotland want to do it, It has come about because the Crown Office, and in particular the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent, who's the most senior civil servant, if you can call it that way, the the equivalent of the the, the, uh, Director General uh, within that department, have been directing it. I know there's great unhappiness within the Crown Office because many people feel that what they've been asked to do is wrong. So I think the Lord Advocate, the Crown Agent, have to consider their positions because they're frankly abusing the police. Police in Scotland are under significant pressure anyway, but under even more pressure because of coronavirus. To be investigating Craig Murray, to have officers interviewing me, having had to see my solicitors before, interviewing Jim Stillers, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, to be asked questions that they know I can't give the answer because I told them, you know, through my solicitor initially, it's a waste of their time. It was written all over the officer's face that they felt this was a waste of their time. When I asked the police, under direction of carrying this out. It was quite clear from the Chief Constable's office, they are carrying out these instructions because they're instructed by the Crown. I'm sure Police Scotland have other things they would rather do than interview Craig Murray or me. There's other things they need to do. There's other things people in Scotland are not getting done because police officers are interviewing Craig Murray, me and everybody else who's ever said, you know, so much as, you know, boo about Alex Salmond or whatever. So it comes back to the Lord Advocate, the Crown Agent, the requirement for a separation of powers and the requirement for in Scotland to consider their positions. I remember after Alex Salmond was acquitted saying heads have to roll. Nobody has resigned. It's quite extraordinary. We have a permanent secretary who has presided over at highest Total incompetence is anybody who walks to Alex Salmond, the committee, the inquiry at the Scottish Parliament to the handling by the Scottish Government. You wouldn't want them to be running a bowling club, never be running your country, you know, in terms of the level of incompetence, and yet nobody has gone. We have a Lord Advocate who was giving evidence and yet was obfuscatory, if that is the word, to put it politely, who wasn't trying to be open and transparent as the Scottish Parliament states. It was shameful. And we have a Scottish National Party chief executive who has been sending WhatsApp messages seeking to put pressure upon the police who still remains in office. How those three are in post beats me. Okay. Um, In the remaining minutes before we get to the questions, I just want to shift a little bit and uh, just talk about what you see as the ideal scenario over the next few months, you know, and, and hopefully achieve, achieving independence, as it, let's just say in, in the next couple of months, several months. How do you think that can happen? And, you know, you know, without delving too much into the plans, but I mean, in very general terms, how do you see that taking place? I think we deliver that independence supermajority. So it's the Scottish Parliament that is demanding independence. We need to have people going out around the capitals of Europe and beyond saying the Scottish Parliament is seeking to now become an independent nation. The people of Scotland are demanding their rights. We've seen major demonstrations and once we get the vaccine rolled out, once it's quite clear that we can start even socially distance having demonstrations, I think we need to start getting our marching boots on to let Boris Johnson know that it's not just, as I say, a government request coming from an SNP administration. It's the people of Scotland through their parliament. It's the people of Scotland in their demonstrations. And we go out and we take that, whether it's through courts in the UK or Scotland, whether it's in courts internationally, whether it's through diplomatic channels, we just make it quite clear. Scotland demands its right to independence. Its people have voted and we want to be able to see Scottish democracy prevail, not to be subject to Boris Johnson saying, don't get uppity, Jock. 
Yeah. And, and how do you see it if, if, well, if let's just, let's just say Alba gets very few seats, if any, uh, this, this, the SNP gets a slight majority, maybe with help of the Greens for a majority. And then they say, we're going to have another refer, we're going to ask uh, Boris Johnson for, a section, Johnson for a section 30, and we will hold a referendum at some point in the future. Uh, how do you, how do you see that working out? I, well, I just don't see it happening. Pretty Johnson's pretty... not going to give a referendum. Johnson will only give a referendum when he thinks we're going to lose it. So he's going to say, you're not getting one now. We already know that you can't carry out a referendum this year because of COP26. So whatever was said, you know, by Ian Blackford, that there'll be a referendum in autumn 2020. Then it was autumn 2021. Now we're told it'll be autumn 2023. It is a perpetual never endum. So that's why, as I say, we do have to get that independent supermajority because I think if we don't get that ALBA representation, then I'm not so sure about the backbone of some of those that will be there in the absence of ALBA. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get to get some of the questions now, Let, uh, starting with Stephen. Uh, can, and, and I'm just reading it out, so I'm, I'm not... I'm not always sure I, I totally understand the question. Can you confirm if ALBA are working directly with the SNP on the ground to keep unionist parties out? Uh, I mean, we're not working directly as such because we're a separate party. Many individuals are. We've got people who are personal friends who are voting ALBA second or have joined ALBA but who are active in campaigns to return SNP MSPs. I've made it quite clear that in my own constituency, I'll be seeking to do everything I can to return Paul McLennan. Uh, equally, I'm advocating an ALBA vote on the list. So as I say, I think it's not a formal alliance, but ALBA is certainly saying vote SNP in constituency, but vote ALBA on the list. Cameron Nish was doing it much more eloquently than me. I think it's a tragedy that uh, SNP is actually still arguing that you should vote SNP on the list when it's a one million wasted votes in 2016, and it's going to be the same this time around. Okay. And from Thomas, uh, why do you think that the labor unions are stating that they won't stand for independence? Do you think it should be up to their members? Uh, again, I, I think th there's been a change in the, the unions. I, I, I mean, I remember arguing that within the SNP group at Westminster, saying that we should be going around the London uh, offices of the trade unions, because there is a sea change. You're right, in 2016, very few trade unions endorsed independence. The Prison Officers Association in Scotland did. Uh, I think the unions uh, at, uh, in East Kilbride uh, took a vote there, uh, and the majority were for it. But the big unions didn't. But I think things have changed. I don't think you would get the big London unions. And I was speaking to Rose Foyer, the, uh, the uh, General Secretary of the STUC, and she was encouraging me to do it. I think we actually need, and it's a job that, you know, I would hope the SNP in Westminster would do because Neil Hanby and I will certainly be seeking to do it, is to go around the big unions in London and say, look, you know that your members voted yes because the majority of trade unionists voted yes in 2016. Even more would vote yes now. I think you might find that a lot of the trade unions in England, and that's what I got from Ross. it's what I picked up from friends because I work closely with justice trade unions down in, in England. I was actually having a... I was chatting about Steve Gillam from the POA, uh, General Secretary, who's, a, who's actually originally from Greenock. I think you're finding a lot of trade unions, they're not going to say yes to independence. What they're probably going to say and where you could get them is to say it's the right of the Scottish people to decide. Yeah. I don't think you would, I would ever expect Unison or the GMB to say vote yes to independence. But I think they might find that if they didn't say it's up to our members, they might find their members will just begin to slip away. So I think there's been a sea change since 2016. And I think in the yes movement, we've got to approach the trade unions to say, why don't you just be neutral? That's what yeah. we can get. Well, um, and uh, it, just, to, just to say that in the uh, in the draft constitution that I'm kind of re redeveloping, uh, you know, from uh, I have put specifically that uh, all workers have the right to form a union and collectively bargain as a basic constitutional right, which has never existed before. And I would hold that maybe if that was presented to them, they would say, uh, "Yeah, I mean, th 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 they would be in favor of that." But let me get through the rest of the uh, the, the questions. Um, let's see. So. Uh, the telephone polls taken with those already registered with those polling companies will not have picked up support on the new party standing. Uh, would you would, would you agree? Or j just basically the validity yeah. of the polling. Yeah, companies. we don't. We we think we're polling a lot higher than those polls show. We are not. Uh, we are not taken by that. All the anecdotal evidence. All the. I mean, the the, the matter. The the the. the, 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 the Margin of error is, I think, three to four percent. So when you're putting it down at four, 
two percent, you can equally be at six percent. I think six percent that was shown in a previous poll is much more accurate. Yeah, okay. Telephone, uh, telephone and polls are and if, and if Scotland doesn't get an independence this time or soon, do you think that Westminster will close down Holyrood? Or how, I mean, we, we we spoke about this earlier in the in the you know that they're attacking and with the uh, internal market bill and these other things that the Holyrood powers are in peril. But how, how would how would you how would you see that? I don't think they'd close it down. I don't think they'd be crass as that, but they'd certainly emasculate it. I think they would take away powers. They would do much more directly from Westminster. And I think it's another reason that we've got to get out of the, the, the UK and get independence, because I lived through the 1980s and what Thatcher did to our uh, economy. Uh, now I sit in the Justice Committee in England and see what the, the landscape in the UK and even in England and Wales is being changed. We see that with a by-election where it looks as if Labour could lose Hartlepool. I'm seeing the landscape in England changing. They're appointing, there's hardly been a post that's come through in the justice world in England that hasn't gone to somebody who's been a Tory or a Tory donor or somebody of their side. You know, they are shameless in stitching up. You know, if I was in Labour, I'd be really worried about how they're ever going to get back. And so I don't think they would be as crass as they were closing their parliament down but it certainly wouldn't be able to operate as it has been. It wouldn't be able to mitigate and protect and our people will suffer because they are changing the, you know, they're robbing the state's assets, but they're changing control of the state's organizations. Yeah. Uh, another question, when we uh, when we get another referendum and we'll see whether it's a referendum or what, what are the means are, but do you think that labor activists will target older voters again and lie to them about how they lose their pensions if they vote for Indy? Um, well, I mean, we were talking about the, the uh, purported tactics of the 2014 election, uh, but you know we'll, we'll see whether it's a referendum or what what the means are. But uh, if you have anything to say about that, well, I think yeah. You know, I mean, the, the unionists have been preparing. They'll have lines about your pension. I was getting it from an interview in Andrew Neil and the, the the Spectator. What was it your pension? If you've got a Scottish currency, what will happen to your pension? There will be all sorts of suggestions about well, if you holiday from Newcastle, you're going to have to show a passport. All of these things. That's why we've got to prepare. You know, I think we can, you know, defeat all these things. We can show there's a political solution, but we've got to lay that down. And that's where it's been shameful that the work hasn't been done. Are they I going agree. to try it again? Absolutely. But equally, you know, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Know, fool me twice, shame on me. I think the people of Scotland will have learned that we've got to be prepared to rebut. I, I agree with that. And I think that, that I think that's a central argument for putting the EFTA membership front and center, because if, if Scotland were a member of EFTA, then they would be able, then Scotland would be able to make their own trade deals, including with England or the RUK or whatever. And you can negotiate your own border situation with, you know, between Scotland and England or the RUK or whatever it is at that point. So, um, you know, I, you know, again, I'm, you know, uh, surprised that there hasn't been much more work on that. And, you know, Jim Sillers was basically saying that it's been the seven year, last seven years have been totally wasted by the Scottish government in, the, in that sense, because they, they it, as he said, uh, in 2014, you had a completely politically engaged population, but there was nothing done after to just to, to get to keep on to that and to keep the people, you know, to keep the people engaged and interested in independence. And that's a lot of that, you know, that that political literacy has gone away. At, at, at least that's what, uh, uh, you know, Jim Sillers had said the other, to me the other week. Well, he's right. I remember going to one of the first, I think it was the first group meeting I went to when elected in December 20, 2019, and saying that the debate, the real debate, had moved from currency and pensions to the border. Since then, I have seen nothing from the SNP leadership, and we've had no discussion at the group about the border. So we've got to do this work. It can be done. It will be done because, you know, to do that, to persuade our people, we have to, you know, have these answers for a referendum and indeed for other campaigns. Uh, so I agree with Jim, it's been seven wasted years. Thankfully, people like Tim Rideout, people in other groups, yourself, Elliot Bomer, John Drummond, have been doing work. It would have been much, much better if the people with the resources had been doing some work as opposed to people doing it in their own spare time. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> How does how does Kenny imagine radical subsidiarity and a transformational flattening of the authorizing environment in Scotland can be supported by ALBA candidates that make it into Parliament? I'm not sure. I totally. Uh, uh, it's not, not quite sure. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I'm a friend of Professor James Mitchell. I mean, I think, I mean, I think, you know, Scottish go local government requires to be empowered. You know, I, and I'm also supportive of, you know, it's, you know well, like Leslie Riddick and others, we've got to get things down more locally. You know, community councils, if you didn't have them, have them, you'd have to invent them. Do they work particularly well at the moment? No, because they don't have a budget, they don't have any powers. So as well as making sure the Scottish Parliament's got the sovereign rights of an independent nation, we have to make sure that local communities have some control over their lives. The fact in East Lothian that it's decisions in Haddington that are made about whether you can have a budget for Dunbar Gala is frankly, you know, ridiculous you know should you have a decisions about whether in you know east linton you should have a belisha beacon or traffic lights that shouldn't necessarily be dealt with by haddington certainly not even by Holyrood. it should be decided by smaller communities so we've got to get the powers into scotland but we've also get the powers downwards and give communities much control over their lives i think that's maybe where he's coming from and, I, and that's a you know james mitchell and others have been doing good work on that yeah uh, Suzanne Campbell, and I think we already answered this, why have there been no resignations regarding the recent, recent debacle? Uh, we're, we're both at a loss, I think we can- Shameless, shameless is how I would put it. Yeah, okay. Uh, Stephen Kelly, uh, have all the indie parties going to sign a joint agreement in black and white so Westminster, England know we have our democratic right? Um, Let's see. We would be happy to do that. We we are uh, we are up for saying that we know an independent supermajority to you know allow the Parliament of Scotland to begin you know the steps towards that transition. So uh, I think that's for others. All I can say is for Alba Party, we are up for doing this, and we're up for working with other independent parties to deliver that. Okay. Uh, another question from Suzanne. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a founding member of ALBA or one of the first members to join. Can you guarantee that when members vote for something, it will be democratic and the decision does not get changed or manipulated to suit what leaders think is best for the party? So if you could speak to, uh, you know, just the the democratic processes within yeah. the party. As, yeah, as I, I mean, we have we are sorry that some things have had to come here. Well, we would much prefer to have had the time to launch a party to build up to the grassroots, but we do want to achieve that. That's what we want to deliver. That's why we've got a women's conference to deliver a women's and equalities paper uh, this weekend. We'll be having another conference in next weekend. There's some things that we had to do basically through executive decision and who the candidates had to be because we had to get in by four o'clock on Wednesday. We only launched key issues that will have to be debated and discussed. So I can give Suzanne the assurance that our intention is that the party should be a membership-based party. It should have, and the constitution that I have seen, you know, mirrors the structures of old SNP. We're not having organisations that are frankly makey-uppy that, you know, don't have a membership base outvoting the rank and file. So there has to be local area branches and build it up in that, uh, that structure. And what's decided by the members should be adhered to by the leadership. Okay. And one final question before, uh, it, I, basically a question of loyalty. I see what you I see what you say, but I'm torn with Alba. I'm an SNP member. My heart says no because I feel like I'd be disloyal to the party. And you, as someone, could be more profound on that subject than probably it's, anybody else on the planet. But how do you see it? How do you see? I that? joined the S I joined the SNP for the cause of independence. It's the cause of independence that is what delivers. Individuals come and go. Alex Salmon, myself, Nicholas Sturgeon, we are transitory, even parties. And we saw that in the referendum. What delivered the referendum result wasn't the SNP, it was pivotal, but it was actually rank and file activists who joined through uh, you know, local yes movements. And that's why I think that this election, it is about voting for the SNP candidate on the constituency, but on the list, it's about maximizing the support for independence. And the way to maximize independence on the list is to vote for ALBA because in 2016, 1 million votes for SNP MSPs, we can deliver ALBA MSPs, and that will change the dynamic with an independent supermajority. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll wrap it up, and uh, I'd appreciate it if after we stop, we could stay on for a couple minutes yeah. and talk, but, uh, but uh, anything else you'd like to say before signing off to our-, our No, I, I, you know, I think this is, this is our moment. This is- our best chance for independence that I think we've ever had. The British state has never been weaker. The opportunity is there. It's the time to strike. And that's why it has to be maximize the yes vote, list vote Alba for that supermajority. I can't say what will happen exactly thereafter, but with a parliament of independence majority, 
then it's game on for us to win our cause. Okay. On that very positive note, uh, thank you so much, Kenny, for being with us thank this you. evening. I really appreciate it. I look forward to uh, having you back as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah.